Some people would say that for South Carolina to defeat Iowa in their Final Four matchup, they just need to simply slow down Caitlin Clark. But it's not going to be that easy. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for the latest headlines and potential storylines on South Carolina Gamecock athletics. I'm Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast, and also a staff writer for Gamecocks Digest over on SI.com. Thank y'all once again for making Locked On Gamecocks your first listen or watch here today. We are free and available on YouTube and also wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. The South Carolina Gamecocks are taking on the Iowa Hawkeyes in the Final Four in just a little over a day and a half or so. The game will be taking place at around 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Friday night. And obviously, one of the big storylines heading into this matchup from South Carolina's side of things is... How are they going to deal with superstar Caitlin Clark, who is averaging almost 30 points a game for Iowa, or has at least up to this point in the season? And here's the thing regarding that question. Caitlin Clark is such a good offensive player that she is going to force South Carolina to do something that they're not used to doing defensively. Choose between one of two strategies that either way is going to hurt them in some capacity. Essentially, there's no foolproof plan to stopping Iowa's offense. And South Carolina, in essence, is going to have to pick their poison in this matchup. So, to dive into this conversation, let's start off with sort of the obvious talking point or obvious strategy here that most people are going to throw out in order for South Carolina to try and slow down Iowa's offense, which is to try and neutralize superstar Kalen Clark as best as you possibly can. Now, what is the biggest concern that Kalen Clark presents on the hardwood? Well, the biggest concern is the fact that Kalen Clark is a player that is so attentive to everything that is going on around her that if you are individually matched up against her, you cannot have any lapses because there's multiple facets of Kaitlyn Clark's game that make her dangerous, like her deep shooting range. And I'm talking she can shoot NBA range three-point shots. So if you're on defense, you cannot let Kaitlyn Clark just casually walk up near the three-point line. And here's the other thing. Even if you guard her remotely close, she possesses a step-back jumper that she hits at a pretty high clip as well. You also have to keep tabs on her on inbound plays because Iowa will try to set screens for her on the wings to try to open up three-point opportunities there as well. She'll also get screens from the high post or near the top of the key to try to attack open driving lanes as Iowa simultaneously brings a front court defender away from the basket, giving, obviously, Kaylin Clark a better opportunity to score a bucket that way. And the thing with her shot selection is Kayla Clark is pretty balanced in how she attacks the offensive end. 48.9% of her shots are three-point attempts. But she's also attempted the second most free throws in Division I women's basketball with 274 free throw attempts to this point in the season. So, essentially, she is either shooting it from behind a three-point line or she is going to the rim. So how could the Gamecocks try and slow down Caitlin Clark? Well, there's a couple things that they could try to do here. Firstly, they could invite the mid-range area of the floor to Caitlin Clark and essentially say, listen, we know we're not going to be able to, again, completely stop you tonight, but we're not going to let you shoot the ball from deep the entire night, and we're also not going to let you drive to the basket and potentially get our front court players in foul trouble. So we're going to let you shoot from mid-range, which is something that, based on the shot selection numbers, seems to be the area where Kalen Clark shoots the ball the least. So that could be one thing 
that Don Staley and this coaching staff try to do. Another thing that they could try to do is full court press her in this game. I talked about this before on the live show after the Maryland game. If I was South Carolina, I would elect to full court press her and wear her down or try to wear her down over the course of this basketball game, knowing that Caitlin Clark is probably going to be playing like 32, 34 plus minutes in this contest, no matter what. Put Bree Beal down there, put Bree Hall down there, put Kiara Fletcher down there. Vary up the defenders that you have going up against Caitlin Clark. Keep those bodies fresh. Make sure that you don't leave one person on her long enough that could potentially get in foul trouble herself. South Carolina has the death advantage by far in this contest, so utilize that to the fullest extent in this game. Now, here's the thing. There is a big risk here with putting the onus of the attention on Caitlin Clark, and that is this. Iowa possesses a lot of shooters in their starting lineup besides Caitlin Clark. Four of Iowa's five starters have taken 106 or more three-point attempts this season, and on average, this group collectively is shooting 39% from three-point range. That is pretty doggone good, especially for the college level. So, if South Carolina elects to, again, try to force Caitlin Clark off the three-point line and make her have to at least drive halfway to the basket and make decisions while sort of in that mid-range area, she could elect to just kick out the basketball to some open teammates if there's some help defense that comes from either side of the court for South Carolina. And that would allow Iowa multiple open looks and some likely automatic scores from, again, three-point range. And here's the other thing. Kaylin Clark is kind of like Raven Johnson in the sense that she likes to run down the floor in transition. And from the highlights that I have watched of Kaylin Clark, when running down transition, more often than not, she is looking down the court for an open teammate. And Iowa usually runs a four-out, one-in offense, which in essence means that they got four players that hover around that three-point line area. So, this is where I get into the point that I brought up earlier. South Carolina, there's no way that they're going to be able to fully stop the Iowa Hawkeyes. I know Gamecock fans would love for Caitlin Clark to be held to like 15 or less points. I know they would love to see South Carolina hold Iowa as a team to maybe 60 or less points. And obviously, if either one of those things happen, then South Carolina has had a phenomenal night on the defensive end. But here's the thing. Iowa, you got to give them some credit. They've made it to the Final Four for a reason. Kaitlyn Clark is considered to be one of the two best women's college basketball players in the game right now for a reason. You have to respect that. And when watching some of the games that Iowa has played this season, as good as South Carolina is defensively, and you could argue, of course, that they would shut down Iowa in the front court area. Iowa could just simply choose to not try to attack them in that way. And with how many shooters they got in that starting lineup, they are bound to get some three-point shot opportunities in this contest. And there's some people that really believe that the only way you can beat South Carolina is by quite literally just outshooting them, just hitting a bunch of three-point shots, and at the same time, hoping that you stop them enough on the defensive end, on your own defensive end of the floor. Now, I will get into that phase of the game in today's show, but point being, South Carolina, you'll have to pick your poison when you're on defense. It's not something they're going to be used to, and it is going to provide a unique challenge when they face Caitlin Clark and the Iowa Hawkeyes on Friday night. Now, of course, South Carolina's football team, they are not playing games right now of this magnitude, especially like South Carolina's women's basketball team is, but they are gearing up for what is going to be a pivotal 2023 season. And one player who might not play as much this year, but is creating a lot of early buzz is quarterback Lenoris Sellers. And we're going to dive into why that is the case in just a couple moments right here on Locked On Gamecocks. 
Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. The Final Four is officially here for both the men's and women's basketball tournaments. And there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars that's up to one thousand dollars back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win essentially you're guaranteed money either way on your first bet on FanDuel if you join right now the FanDuel sportsbook app is safe it's secure and it's super easy to use and you can bet on literally anything that you want to the Gamecocks money line odds have been set at minus 850 50 for their matchup against the Iowa Hawkeyes on Friday night. And despite everything I just said about Caitlin Clark, obviously there is a reason why South Carolina has not lost a game up to this point in the season. So if you feel like it's guaranteed money, put the money down on the minus 850 money line for South Carolina. Don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Welcome back to this Thursday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. Let's talk about South Carolina's football program and an early enrollee that is making a lot of noise in spring practice. And that early enrollee is Lenora Sellers. And I got to say, based on some of the comments that have been made by teammates in the past day or so, it seems like that Lenora Sellers, honestly, if we want to project long-term, might have a chance to break the Gamecocks all-time QB rushing yard record. And in terms of the comments that I just referenced, Tyree Johnson, Amari and Brown, TJ Sanders, and Marcellus Dow all met with the media on Wednesday afternoon. And each of these guys was asked about Lenore Sellers and what they've seen from the young quarterback so far in spring practice. And they talked a lot about one particular aspect of his game that I want to highlight here in this little clip montage that I created for all of you here on YouTube. And also, if you're listening to this on an audio podcast app. Tyreek, you're, I think, seven practices into the spring now. Who are some of the guys, whether it's freshmen or some transfers, that have kind of caught your eye on both sides of the ball? I'd say uh, Lenore is. <laughs> Man, he's going to be special. We, if, if we leave a gap open or a seam, and he got our opportunity to run, he's going to take it, man. He's just so fast. Uh, he had a, a couple runs yesterday where we are like, oh, hold on now. You what have you seen from him and going against maybe him in that offense or yeah. seeing it on the sideline? Well, the noise, he's going to be a problem. Uh, the all the quarterbacks, he's definitely the fastest. Uh, we got some legs. He can run a lot. He can run good, too. He's he not just a sit back and throw it. He's not just sitting back in the pocket and throwing it. He can, he can run really good. He thought he was good at Madden. Uh, <laughs> Played him a couple times, you know, showed him that he needs to practice a little bit. Okay, yeah, so that last bit about Amari and Brown and Lawrence Sellers uh, playing Madden together obviously has nothing to do with this conversation. I just thought that that was a very funny comment by Amari and Brown. But here's the thing. Um, obviously, the rushing yard record that's held by Connor Shaw is one that... You know, not very many quarterbacks have gotten anywhere close to. Connor Shaw rushed for 1,683 yards during his time here at South Carolina. And that is why when you hear what these guys have said regarding Lenore Sellers and his athleticism and running ability, it gives off the impression that, you know, if he ends up being a multi-year starter, like most people think he will be, then he could very well have a shot here. And the thing that really stood out to me from those comments that were made by each of his teammates was one specifically made by defensive tackle T.J. Sanders when he said that he was, quote, definitely the fastest out of all the quarterbacks. That's talking about a group that includes Luke Doty, who is extremely fast in his own right and is a guy that some have said before had more straight line speed than Connor Shaw. And Connor Shaw, if y'all need a reminder of how fast he was, he ran a 4.58 40-yard tash at the NFL Combine back in 2014. Pretty doggone fast. And to be honest, Connor Shaw was a true dual-threat quarterback before being a dual-threat quarterback was cool in the game of football. So, again, you probably won't see Lenora Sellers 
play at all in year one. Because of all the players that have been in the program longer than him, the depth that is in front of him right now, unless, of course, there's catastrophic injuries, which obviously we all hope is not the case. But let's say that he starts, say, in 2024, 2025. He's going to have three, four years to potentially break that record of Connor Shaw's that, again, sits at 1,683 rushing yards. And even in a pro-style offense, Lenore Sellers, he could have plenty of opportunities and plenty of different concepts that could allow him to accomplish such a feat. He could be featured on many play-action rollout passes or bootleg plays, which usually, of course, forces the quarterback to have to leave the original pocket and move horizontally on the football field. And with a guy like Nolan Sellers, if you're a defense that does not have a spy on him and you give him like 10, 15, 20 yards of cushion, he's going to be able to easily scamper and get a first down probably nine times out of 10. You could also include Nolan Sellers on some QB draws. You could even run some QB powers for him because of the fact that he is a towering figure at the quarterback spot. I think he's currently listed right now at six foot three, 232 pounds. That's a pretty big SEC quarterback right there. And so when you combine what we already know about Lenore Sellers and what we have heard about him in terms of what he did at South Florence High School, and then you throw all that in with what his teammates are saying about him so far in spring practice, there's very good reason to be excited about Lenore Sellers and what he could do on the football field. But again, it's not just the arm that has people really excited about his game. It is his legs as well. And again, he could be the first quarterback, honestly, since Connor Shaw, that has really offered that dual threat ability at a very high level here at South Carolina. And with what South Carolina is bringing in so far with offensive linemen, could you imagine the creative opportunities that that could allow for Dow Lockins or whoever maybe the next offensive coordinator is after him? Should he be successful enough to where he moves on to another job? The possibilities are endless here with Norris Sellers because of multiple different facets of how he operates as a football player and also as a person. But his legs and his dual threat ability is reason to be excited for the future of South Carolina's quarterback position all right now let's stick with South Carolina's football program but let's move over to the recruiting front and a very interesting development that is currently ongoing right now with a potential wide receiver target for Shane Beamer and South Carolina's football coaching staff as Trajan Bridges a Juco wide receiver out of East Los Angeles College and a part of the 2023 recruiting class apparently was on a visit to South Carolina's recent spring practice on Tuesday afternoon. Trajan Bridges posted this photo to his Instagram story for those of you watching today's show on YouTube and clearly showing the Steve and Jerry Spurrier indoor practice facility there and Fisher Brewer of the Gamecocks Digest staff, the website that I also work for, he ended up reaching out to Trajan Bridges to try to get more insight into sort of where he is right now with South Carolina. And apparently, Trajan Bridges is going to be making another visit to South Carolina, but the next time he's here, he's going to be here for the spring game on April the 15th. So what is the connection here and what do we need to know about Trajan Bridges? Well, here's the thing. Bridges was at Oklahoma for the 2019 and 2020 seasons, which means that he has a connection to both Spencer Rattler, obviously the starting quarterback at South Carolina, and South Carolina head football coach Shane Beamer, both guys who were there during that same stretch. Now, here's the reason why he's no longer at Oklahoma. Trajan Bridges was kicked off the team in the 2020 offseason after an incident that occurred, I believe, on April 15, 2021, which led to the following charges. Robbery, conspiracy, and aiding and abetting with a dangerous weapon. So, because of those three charges being brought against him, he wound up being firstly suspended and then pretty quickly kicked off of the team by Lincoln Riley. I believe he had to post a $70,000 bond. And after that, he had to go through GPS monitoring and had to be constantly 
meeting with the bonds persons and the GPS monitoring agency. And that's according to some information that I came across from the Fan Nation affiliate site All Sooners on Wednesday afternoon. Now, hopefully, of course, Trajan Bridges has grown up since that incident. And considering the fact that Shane Beaver and South Carolina's football coaching staff seem to have some interest here with Trajan Bridges, I would say that it seems like that's the case. I'm going to trust the judgment, and I think everyone should trust the judgment of Shane Beamer and the staff that they did their due diligence, they did their homework, and based on that and their interactions with Trajan Bridges, they believe that Trajan Bridges is a new person since all that took place a couple of years ago. Now, when looking at his high school film, it's pretty easy to see why Shane Beamer and the staff are interested in Trajan Bridges because when watching his film from back in like 2017, 2018, admittedly a good while back, Bridges showed great release and acceleration off of the line of scrimmage. And combined with great hand-eye coordination and natural ball skills at the wide receiver position, it makes Trajan Bridges a big-time downfield receiving threat. Now, he is not exactly a burner per se. He's not a guy that's going to just run five yards past each and every defensive back that he goes up against. But again, he has enough of the skills that you need at an outside wide receiver spot to go out there and make explosive plays happen in the passing game. And here's the thing. South Carolina's receiving core, while they like probably the top end of that group and the veterans that they got, of course, in Antoine Juice Wells, Xavier Leggett, Amari and Brown throw into carry on Joyner when he is taking wide receiver reps. You got Eddie Lewis, the transfer out of Memphis. While they like that group, there is admittedly a pretty decent drop off after that group, at least in terms of the experience factor. Trajan Bridges, while again, he's been playing Juco ball for the last year or so, he would help out a great deal in terms of adding some experienced depth at this spot. I don't think he would be a starter by any means, at this position, if he hypothetically, say, committed to South Carolina. But again, watch some of his film on Huddle, and it's pretty easy to see why Shane Beamer and this staff are interested. So he used to say, Trajan Bridges is going to be a prospect to watch moving forward. Again, he is a part of the 2023 recruiting class. That might be confusing, but here's the thing. You do not have to sign on the second national signing day. You can indeed take more time to make your final decision. Now, the deadline, I do believe, is coming up pretty soon. So I don't think that this process or this recruitment with Trajan Bridges is going to carry out a whole lot longer beyond South Carolina's spring game if he does indeed end up deciding that he's going to come to Carolina. But I will say this, with the connections here with Shane Beamer and Spencer Rattler, and again, the need for some more depth at the wide receiver spot, it would not shock me in the least if at the end of the day, Trajan Bridges winds up being a Gamecock here for the 2023 season. So again, keep your eyes on Trajan Bridges as a recruitment to watch for the 2023 cycle in the coming weeks and month. But with that being said, y'all, that is going to do it for today's show of the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast. I hope y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show as always. What are your thoughts on South Carolina's matchup defensively with Caitlin Clark and the rest of Iowa's offense? Do you think that this is going to be a challenging matchup in terms of, again, the Gamecocks may be needing to pick their poison as to what they're going to allow and what they're not going to allow in their matchup with the Hawkeyes on Friday night? Let me know your thoughts on that topic and the other ones I discussed on today's show down below in the comments section. If you watch today's show on YouTube or if you listen to today's show on an audio podcast app, you can shoot me a direct message on Twitter at a line underscore SC. And I'll try to respond to your message or comment as quickly as I see it. And once again, thank y'all so much for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first watch or listen here today. For your second listen or watch, go check out Locked On College Basketball, where experts Isaac Shade and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know, both on and off the court. Plus, you'll hear from big name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. Locked On College Basketball is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. But with that being said, y'all, that does it for me on today's show. Have a great rest of your Thursday, and I will catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks Podcast.